Hello there. I'd like to welcome you again to another edition of Leading Edge, a weekly resource to support your leadership journey as we seek to raise effective godly leaders. Now, in the last three weeks, we've been looking at the series, The Magic of a Great Team. So far, we have covered the principles of effective team selection to the power of a cohesive team. And just last week, we did getting the best out of your people. Today, we shall take the final installment in this series as we examine what I have called the six ways to build a high-performing team. Now, let me start this way. Have you ever been part of a star team, a great team in your place of work or your organization? A team where you and your team members accomplished big goals and did great things. A team where you look forward to work every day and you were filled with energy. A team, I would say, with strong cohesion, where you felt valued and everyone contributed to doing meaningful work, where work was fun and a great adventure. I have been there a couple of times. Then how about a hellish team? Ever been there? <laughs> Ever been part of a sloppy, losing, dysfunctional team? A team characterized by fear, toxicity, conflicts, anxiety, low productivity. A team where you constantly look forward to missing work or going on vacation. <laughs> I've been there too. And trust me, I can tell the difference. There is nothing like being in a great team with strong performance outcomes. Winning can be fun, great fun, and quite fulfilling. So the question then will become, how does a leader create a high-performing team? The approach we shall take today will be to examine a very interesting corporate turnaround story and glean from it six principles for transforming a weak team to a high-performing team. Now, it was in 1989, the Scandinavian shipping giant, Will Henson, had achieved a major corporate milestone they had just added a ninth large carrier to their fleet. It was therefore a cause to celebrate. So, on a cool September morning in 1989, the entire management team flew from Oslo to Hamburg. Then, tragedy struck. The plane crashed, killing all 50 passengers and wiping out top two layers of management. They were all gone. What was left of the company was a team of heavily grief-stricken, confused, and agitated junior managers and downwards. What will become of this company? How do you get the team to work again? It was at this time that Inga Skog, CEO of a Scandinavian Air SAS, took the saddles as CEO in Wilhelmsen. All the odds were simply against him. He was transiting from a CEO role to his first CEO role, a transition that can naturally be a tough for most people, a transition that typically requires the invaluable support of the team, a team that is at its best shape. Skog had none of that. He was leading and learning at the same time. Employees were still overcome with grief and trapped in mourning. People who hardly focus. Skog recollects that he will step into a meeting with staff and midway, people start sniffing and sobbing. Or, or a business issue will be up for discussion as someone just suddenly starts talking about the accident. This was not all. The company's financial performance was going south. Company equipment, facilities, and offices were in bad shape. This was a company paralyzed by grief, to say the least. What can one hope to expect from such a company and such a team? Note this, no matter where things are, outcomes are not fixed. I'll say that again, outcomes are not fixed. The best teams can die, and so can the weakest teams rise to exceptional performance. Outcomes are not fixed. The key variable in all of this will be leadership. People and company resources are neutral. Leadership is the catalyst. It determines the direction of an institution's results. So first, let's look at what Wilhelmsen looked like at the end of Skog's tenure as CEO, which lasted the next 20 years. The company had moved from just a shipping company to one of the top global names in maritime and logistics. Revenue had moved from $250 million 
to $5 billion. <laughs> Operations are scaled to 500 office locations in 100 countries. They had increased the number of ships from 9 to a whooping 164. And employees are risen from 3,500 to 23,000. Talk of exponential growth. So, how do you move such a team that is at its lowest to a start team, as we find with Will Hempson? How do you move your team, at whatever point it is at, to the best expression of itself? How do you transform your team to a high-performing one? Yeah? So, what does SCOG do to unshackle a team in grief to deliver extraordinary growth over the next 20 years? So, we shall use SCOG's story as a framework for transforming a team from low performance to high performance. So, let's start. Number one, reframe. First, demonstrate patience. You don't plan change in a hurry. As Skog explained, one of the big things that helped him when he took over his grieving team was that sheer power of learning to be quiet and listen. This doesn't come natural to leaders, given the intensive nature of leadership. Skog said, I had to work at keeping my mouth shut and my ears open. I think there's great wisdom there. He engaged the people asking them lots of questions and listening patiently. And he had learned a lot in the process. He saw those who were eager to move on and the others who chose to be stuck in grief. Next, he spent time meeting clients, reviewing talents, strategy, culture, and business processes. Then he started talking about the need to have a performance-driven company culture. This was to prepare the team for the upcoming changes. On the anniversary of the accident, they had an event that involved the families of the deceased. Now, at this point, he decided that it was time to drive changes. The point is that every building project takes time. Transformation takes time to happen. So, demonstrate patience. Any overnight success you see takes long sleepless nights of real work to deliver. Patience enables you to have a well-informed perspective about your team, about the people, about the business context. One of the great lessons you learn at this stage about your people is that a weak team does not necessarily mean that the people are individually weak. Take note of that. Chances are that in a so-called weak or low-performing team, there could be many high performers. A weak team could just mean that the strengths and capabilities of each individual member is not being harnessed appropriately to deliver the team goal. Take the time to uncover the real issues. Don't be in a hurry to arrive at some conclusions and assigning blames. So carefully listen and learn. This is an invaluable process for crafting the most effective team management plan or some overall changes to culture or strategy. I am aware that often you could be under pressure to move to the path of success and growth, <laughs> but be careful about how and especially when to apply the pressure button on your team. Pressure should only come after proper awareness and planning. Otherwise, it can go awfully wrong. So, take the time to know your team. Know the business context and get to the roots of what may potentially be hampering exponential performance. This way, you can effectively craft appropriate solutions. And now number two, recast. Now this is to align culture and strategy. Now corporate culture is critical in driving and delivering company strategy. A strategy around improving client experience, for instance, will fail woefully if there is no embedded culture of service among the ranks. Culture affects performance. Behind every high-performing team is a set of corporate culture, or what you call behaviors, that aligns with and enables performance. So, Skog set out to reappraise the internal culture climate, as it were. Knowing that no one leader determines the pillars of a corporate culture nor drives it solo, Skog sought to build a co-created corporate culture. First, he initiated a culture survey so that there will be data 
to underscore the need for a new culture and the direction it should take. The outcome of the survey <laughs> overwhelmingly supported the need for change if the company was to grow. So, the people have spoken, not Skog. <laughs> Based on this, he brought together the two layers of the management team in a leadership offsite to recast the company vision, strategy, culture, and the overall direction. Collectively, they arrived at a new direction. The value of this was that the vision and strategic direction was not scores, it was a collective vision. There was a clear alignment at the leadership level. Now, this is a critical item, alignment. If a culture of performance is to be embedded in a team. SCOG leveraged an all-important tool for leaders, feedback and co-creation of corporate direction. Now, to build a high-performing team, ensure that you build a culture that will support the strategic direction of the team. Elicit the invaluable involvement of your people in this process. Ensure ownership and alignment of the team with that direction. So, feedback and open conversations become important here. You can do this by creating and sharing a survey that requires every team member to share their views on what it will take to achieve great performance. The focus will be to get very honest and constructive feedback that will inform you on the best course to take as you strive to build a star team. As Korg himself noted, culture drives business, period. It's not the other way around. Get your culture right, hold firm to your values, and the financial results will follow. Hmm. Okay, so number three, recharge. This is to say, give work and power back to your people. One important trust-building thing that Skog did was to decentralize power instead of consolidating power around himself, which most leaders do. He refused to make decisions that he felt some other people in the team should make. In a sense, he chose to depend on team members to do what they should do for the company without fear. He gave away power to the people. The powerful thing about delegated authority and empowerment like this is that you make the people accountable. It heightens the sense of ownership and commitment. But to build a high-performing team, what will I say? Give your people power. Number four, reshape. Now, have the courage to realign the team if you have to. Be firm in driving performance. If you have empowered your people and they still fall short of expectations, consider making changes. It can be a tough but necessary decision. SCORE was soon to identify members of the team who were incapable of fitting into the new levels of responsibility. Courageously, he rewarded those who fit the bill, promoting them or expanding their responsibilities. He let go those who continue to be a drag on the team. And then he brought in competent people from outside the company to strengthen the team. This is critical in driving high performance in a team. Performance outcomes must have consequences. Let me say that again. Performance outcomes must have consequences. People's performance should elicit management response. And that management response could be reward, it could be support, it could be sanction. This sends a strong message to everyone. Where there are no consequences for performance, mediocrity becomes a subculture. As Korg explained, it quickly became clear that not everyone was willing to leave according to the new arrangements, so he had to let them go. Such tough decisions save the individuals from themselves and the team from imploding. When you don't drive performance, the team dies. It dies to its purpose, its reason for being. It dies to its relevance. So, be courageous to reshape the team, if need be. Some will be shaped up, others will be shaped out. That is the work of leadership. Number five, refresh. Now, a cultural performance is a continuum, so sustain it. In a high-performing team, leaders inspire their people more than they drive them. Think about that. It is more pull than push. Now, as results started showing, Skog began to help his people see the connection between the growing financial results and the new corporate culture of performance. 
he began to constantly reinforce and strengthen the culture. The values of the company were elevated above business performance. Violations of values were met with maximum sanctions, regardless of an individual's strong financial performance. The point is that performance is only an outcome of certain behaviors. <laughs> Leaders constantly direct their energies towards inspiring their people to embrace those behaviors that deliver performance. Now, communication is key here. My recommendation is communicate again and again and again. You never really over-communicate when you seek to build a great team. It's okay to sound like a broken record when it comes to the team vision. Keep at it. Keep at the values, at the vision, at the culture that deliver strong outcomes. Finally, number six, raise the bar. Attempt stretching goals. The best way to get your team shooting for the skies is to point the skies to them as the only desirable direction to aim. <laughs> Leaders of high-performing teams have that uncanny capability to make the team believe that the skies are reachable. They set stretching goals for them and show them that it is possible. Once growth started, Skog stretched it more and more. He said that from that point on, commitment to a healthy, productive culture became part of their DNA. Skog started acquiring company after company as they drove growth consistently year after year. Now, to build a high-performance team, the leader helps the team see that they are capable of doing something extraordinary, something beyond what others do. When a team accomplishes one extraordinary thing, it only leaves them pumped up with a greater belief that more is possible. Now, that's how a team just goes on beating its own record after record. So, don't win once. Make winning a habit. <laughs> Excellent. So here, we have covered the six ways to build a high-performing team. As we close, let me remind you again that the leader is the most critical factor that determines the direction a team goes, up or down. A leader is a catalyst. If you are familiar with the story of King David in the Bible and other historical documents, you will hardly miss the mention of his mighty men. There are records of the 37 of his mighty men and the great feats they accomplished. Some of these men were your average nobodies before they joined forces with David. But after some time with the heroic king, their lives were transformed. They too became mighty. In our modern times, there are lots of similar stories of heroes in various fields. Coaches turning weak sports teams into champions. Teachers with poor performing students turning into exceptional students. Parents from dysfunctional homes swimming against the tides of their own terrible background to raising great kids who break great records. The point here is that every team member or team is only a raw material with which the leader can build. Underperformer is only a tag. And tags can be changed. The underperformer can become a high flyer. That's my point. Weak teams can be turned to star teams. It only takes building patiently, block upon hard block. <laughs> that is the work of leadership. Indeed, a great leadership is a choice. I challenge you today to move your team from hell to the skies. A high-performing team is possible. Let me ask you, make it happen. Great. So here we come to the end of the session today. And I want to encourage you, if you have not started following us on all our social media handles, please do so today. And continue to like, share, and comment on this video if it's been helpful to you. Thank you again for joining. This has been Leading Edge.